long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a Doof Media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series. My name is Pear Daly, and I'm joined as always by my root companion, Matt Freeman. Matt, say hello to the people. Oh, hello, everyone. Well, you know, well, I sound very root. I, I'm it's so insensitive of you. You, you got you got better. Yeah, I'm, I, I did. Yeah. <laughs> This week, we begin book five, Wolves of the Kala, and discuss uh, the prologue and the first three chapters of part one, Todash. So at the beginning of this book, we meet the residents of Calabrin Sturgis, a group of farmers terrorized every generation by the mysterious and dangerous wolves. Then we return to our Katet as they reach Endworld, and, well, some some crazy shit starts happening. Eddie and Jake go Todash into 1977 New York City, and Susanna's got a new person inside her. In more ways than one. Mm -hmm. Matt, what did you think about this week's reading? Well, like you said, uh, there's a lot of crazy shit. (laughs) It's going to take a while to get through all this crazy shit. I told you there would be a Helm's Deep. There's even orcs. Didn't didn't you say that we already did Helm's Deep? Um, I thought that's what you said. Maybe. I don't think so. I think (laughs) I, I think what I said was I'm trying to decide if what we just did was Helm's Deep or if we're going into Helm's Deep. Oh, yes. And then I I sat here um, with my eyes bulging, uh, but you couldn't <laughs> see them not saying anything at all. <laughs> a, a blood vessel in your temple pulsing. <laughs> yes, yeah. It's yes, a good thing yes. we don't have video. Um, yeah. Anyway, I'm extremely into what's happening here. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty strong opening, I think. Um, there's there's lots of plot, which is kind of unusual for King, right? Um, I think he's he's setting up a lot of things. You can tell this is going to be the beginning of the book episode because he's just setting up a lot of things. So a mm-hmm. lot of stuff happens in these four chapters we're talking about today. Yeah, that's a good point. If, uh, uh, if you look across all the Dark, Dark Tower books so far, it does seem like this is the one where he just dives right into it right mm-hmm. um yeah. just what stuff's happening immediately i mean this this prologue is especially uh good and i'm excited that we're gonna get to talk about that in short order yeah yeah it's gonna be a lot of fun um before we do that though i just had a quick announcement for everyone um i guess i laid on the nobody likes my spreadsheet sympathy <laughs> a, a bit too thick last week man because <laughs> we got so many wonderfully nice messages from people saying oh scott don't worry i love your spreadsheet so thank you so much for all the spreadsheet love i really do <laughs> appreciate that i was not looking for the sympathy vote but i do i do very much appreciate that it is a good looking spreadsheet it really I, I, is sometimes i just open it up in the middle of the day and i just say hey how you doing <laughs> <laughs> i believe you is the thing <laughs> All right, that's all I had. Uh, let's just jump right into it. It's going to be a packed episode. We're, we've our, our episodes have been getting longer and longer, and we really don't like that. We want to stay under two hours, so we're going to try really hard in this episode to stay under two hours. You folks listening at home, keep us honest, because if you see the runtime of this episode and if it's over two hours, I just want you to email me shame. That's all you have to say. That's all you have to say, and I'll know that I failed you. Sometimes people say, oh, no, we want the episodes to be longer, and to that I say, um the human brain really can't stay smart and quick on its feet for more than like two hours really or at least mine can't so it's really just in the interest of keeping the 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 quality up honestly Um, yeah yeah i mean it is the keeping the quality up and i do think you know when i i listen to a bunch of podcasts and when i see the podcast i see a two uh in the hour spot on any podcast there is part of me that just kind of goes Okay, I'm in. I'm in for the long one. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. and we want to, we want to avoid that feeling. I agree. So we should stop talking about how we're going to save time and actually do it. And let's jump into the book. Um, before we start talking about the prologue itself, I wanted to do what we normally do at the beginning of books, which is kind of talk about the book as a whole. So here we go. Wolves of the Callow was published on November fourth, two thousand and three, six years to the day after Wizard and Glass. And of course, King, in between these these two books, was doing absolutely nothing. Uh, he published five novels: Bag of Bones, The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon, Dreamcatcher, Black House, and From a Buick Eight. He also wrote two short story collections: Hearts in Atlantis and Everything Is Eventual. And of course, his very famous nonfiction memoir on writing. 
So uh, nothing going on. As usual, slacking off between Dark Tower books. Yeah, what a slacker. What a slacker. But that is not the only thing that happened in between these books, Matt. And we have to talk about something before we get into this book. Because in June of 1999, King was walking down Main State Road number 5, a walk he took just about every day when he was struck by a distracted driver in a minivan. He suffered from a collapsed lung, multiple fractures in his right leg, and a broken hip. They thought they were going to actually have to amputate the leg for a bit. Um, and they thought like he was lucky that he was conscious enough to give his contact information for them to call people because like he literally could have died he's like he got very very lucky Mm -hmm. um it will not surprise you at all to know that he was back working and writing again he was writing his memoir on writing before the end of july so the accident happened mid-june before the end of july he's back in the chair writing again despite the fact that he could only he was in so much pain that he could only stay sitting in like a sitting writing position for about 40 minutes at a time which means he was doing 40 minutes of writing a day and that's all he could physically do before the pain was too much and he had to stop but he kept going he kept going because he's stephen fucking king yeah uh, if, if we were talking about literally any other human than this man i would be surprised to hear <laughs> that but but no you're right i'm not surprised at all yeah, it's it's incredible. Like, I mean, there was actually a point I, he says all this in his memoir. If you've never read on writing anyone listening or you, Matt, I really strongly suggest you reading this memoir. It's it's very fascinating. Um, it's like writing advice, but also just him talking about his life a little bit um, like a memoir. And <laughs> <laughs> he talks about how he almost quit. He almost quit writing like he almost was just like, I can't do this anymore. This hurts too much. Um, and he had kind of lost the will to do it for a while, which is something he's not used to as because we talked about he is the type of writer that writes every day. It doesn't matter what's going on. He's writing every single day um, and he lost it for a little while. And of course, we are very lucky that he got it back because he's been writing ever since. Um, and, and I mentioned this accident because I, I think. You know, it is is an extremely important event in King's life that I, I do think the Dark Tower series as a whole kind of pivots around. Stephen King almost died, and he almost died with his magnum opus unfinished. The, the next and final three books in the series, book five, six, and seven, will only be released months, not years apart. Uh, this one came out in November of 2003. In June of 2004, book six comes out, and then in September of 2007, or 2004, sorry, book seven comes out in September of 2004. So between the release of book five and the release of book six is less than a year. It's 11 months. Um, so it's very clear that this near death experience of his kind of lit a fire under him to, to finish the series. Um, but it also unquestionably changed the series as well, because I don't think you go through an experience like that without kind of it changing you in some way and that change is reflected in the books and the how and the why and, and in what exact way it changed him and it changed the series are questions that you and I will be looking at and answering as we go through the rest of these books but um, I just wanted to bring this up at the beginning because it is a very important event to the author um, it, it's a big deal yeah um, for sure I, I I did not know that that happened uh, uh, between these particular books although obviously I was familiar with the story Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I was thinking about this, I was, I've been thinking for a while about the fact that drawing of the three is often mentioned as like everybody's favorite book ever. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you and a few other people I've heard say, oh, but Wizarding Glass is is also really fantastic. It's really great. But like, I've never heard people just raving in the same way about books past, past that point, basically. And this is just a very uneducated guess, really. But like, I wonder if if his his haste to finish might have something to do with it or or maybe an alternative hypothesis uh people got spoiled because they got all these books so close together that they um didn't yeah. appreciate them in, in individually i mean i i don't know I, I i don't have an opinion i haven't read the books yet so maybe i'm way off base but um it's just a thought based on what what you just told me yeah we'll see i mean i don't i don't want to preface your experience with the books too much by really diving into what people's reaction to them was. I will say that there were quite a few people more than I thought, actually, that as you and I prepared to begin this book that were interacting with us on Twitter saying how, how excited they were because this is one of, if not their favorite book in the series, Wolves of the Cala. So, um, I, I, I think that's really cool and, and we'll talk about it. I mean, I think you, you can maybe already tell in these, in this, just this little bit that we were talking about this week that, I think I think like I'm trying to figure a way to explain this without without ruining any anything or hinting towards anything. But I think like 
the first four books, I think King is telling a story and he's enjoying telling the story. I think it's very clear to me personally at the beginning of this book, th- especially this time around, that he now knows where he's going and he knows he's get what he has to do to get there. And so like there's it's not that there's focus in this book, but he he's he's got the he's got the whole picture in sight now Mm -hmm. and i think in general the the general opinion of stephen king books is that the the setup and the the early and mid parts of the book are always more enjoyable than the end it's not a thing i quite agree with at all times but like the, the when he's really setting up the characters and setting up the the setting and and showing all these interactions and and really diving into the world are always more satisfying to experience than like with the parts where they the questions start getting answered and if you look at the dark tower as just one long book i think that could be what these next three stand for is like okay now we're going to start like answering questions and we're going to start really trying trying to dive into what the series is, is actually saying and what it's doing and what the overall themes of the series are um and i think that is to some people just less satisfying um so if you're looking for why people say the first four books are their are their favorites and less these last three that that could be a reason yeah it, you know you made me kind of remember how like there's there's people whose favorite movie is return of the jedi and there's people whose favorite movie is a new hope and there's people whose favorite book is is fellowship of the ring and there's people mm-hmm. whose favorite is the two towers and and there's just different different kind of feelings and things that appeal to different people so yeah totally makes sense to me um and i mean what what i've seen of this book so far i'm just like really into so um yeah yeah uh, me personally i adore the, i adore where the story goes from here i really do and i'm very excited to talk about it with you because as i mentioned last week um there's a there's a lot of stuff that is going to be very fun to really dive into and explore um, thematically that I've been looking forward to getting into with you for a long, long time. So um, let's do it. All right. Um, Just one final note. This book is dedicated to Frank Mueller, Mueller or Mueller. I don't actually know how to pronounce his last name. I feel bad. I think Mueller is what I remember. There's no E there. So Mueller would be right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Who is of course the man responsible for the audio books that you've been enjoying very much since the drawing of the three. Mueller was also in an accident uh, in between these books. His his occurred in the year 2001 and he was on his motorcycle. He suffered uh, a terrible brain injury, which left him hospitalized until his death a few years later. I I bring this up only to only because I think with the exception of which book are you covering next, the most emails we've gotten are from people relaying the very sad story of of, of Frank Muller's fate um, to you specifically. They usually they usually write you specifically in the email, Matt. And I was kind of I was holding off on sending those to you because I didn't want you to, to know and be sad and be waiting for this this moment where he's no longer going to be doing um the the audiobook readings um i i found this extremely touching though like that the, the, just like basically every time you mentioned how much you were enjoying the audiobook we got a new email from someone that says like yeah me too but but look what's about to happen yeah um that it's just like it just shows me that you know the people that listen to the show in general you know really really love the series and it showed me that not only do people love the series and love reading it but that that they they have like fallen in love with Frank Muller's work as well, that it, that was almost as big of a part of their dark tower experience as the writing itself. Sure. And I think that's really cool. Yeah. I mean, he's more than just reading it. He, he is the actor, right? He, yeah, he yeah. is, he is Roland and Eddie and, and Susanna. And I mean, I, 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 when I think of Roland, I think of the voice that he does for Roland. So yeah, it, yeah. it, it is, it is sad to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, George uh, Guidal, who worked, uh, who did the the Gunslinger, the first book in the series, uh, kind of takes the spot and and takes us to the finish line here. Um, and he does a good job. Like I don't want to take anything away from him. He's he's very good. He's very experienced. But I agree with you. I, I haven't listened to the audiobooks quite as much as you have. I, I usually just like pick and choose and listen to parts of different parts. But man, I love I loved Mueller's work. Yeah. it was really good. Yeah. Um, and it's it's really tragic what happened to him. Yeah, definitely. Um, apparently, like he learned that his wife was pregnant, and the accident happened on his way. Yeah, home. I read that, which and is just awful. I've just been like thinking about that since I read that. I'm just like, mm-hmm. God damn it, it's that's horrible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's interesting. Guido, I'm not sure how to say that name honestly, uh, was also the voice actor for The Left Hand of Darkness and I think American Gods 
which we we covered both of those in book club so and and he, he's just like in like almost absurdly uh prolific with uh yeah audiobooks so yeah it's kind of crazy um we haven't actually talked about this this might be a fun doof cast topic at some point in the future about the the readers of audiobooks because it is such an interesting and and difficult skill um to 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 really be good at it like i mean you and i have over the past few years done book club and we've done these shows where we tend to read a lot of the sections of the book and it, it's just it, it makes it very apparent to me like how easy it is to be really shitty at that oh yeah <laughs> and and how difficult it is to be really really good at it in the way that that these professional readers are and it just it's it's a thing that fascinates me like how do you get good at that yeah how, how do you direct like every one of these has a director that's like directing the the audiobook reader like how how do you get good at like no telling them where to where to pause and where to slow down and i don't know it's fascinating i, I would almost guess that 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 every line requires more than one take yeah um yeah. That would, that's just a guess i have no idea but like but how, that would take so long it, it, it would take so long i mean you <laughs> like like i can't even get through like a page without a without a minor mistake at least yeah yeah um, yeah and this is this is zero mistakes in you know 20 30 hours of reading in, insane insane yeah, yeah. What a talent. Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's move into the book itself, Matt. Um, as usual now, I say as usual, as in this is the second time we've done it and I'm going to do it forever from now on because I love it. <laughs> We're going to talk about the quotes that the book begins with. The first one here is a quote from Steve McQueen from The Magnificent Seven. It says, Mr. We deal in lead. Um, I've got a lot to say about uh, Magnificent Seven here in this episode in a little bit so we don't have to spend a lot of time on this one other than i think this is a great tone setting one <laughs> yeah for like just just in case you forgot this is still a western story we're in for sure um yeah i guess this is the point where i admit that i haven't seen the magnificent seven and then we get the angry emails <laughs> um, i don't know if there's going to be as many angry emails for that one um should i the magnificent seven is a good movie but i would i would seven samurai i think is it should be seen before magnificent seven okay. in my opinion well maybe i'll just watch both of those you know yeah. just solve yeah. just solve the problem yeah all right An another bonus episode fuck we got to stop promising me <laughs> okay okay um the next one is first come smiles then lies last is gunfire and this quote interestingly is attributed to a, a one Roland Deschain of Gilead. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I think it's really fascinating that King begins his book by quoting his own character in the, the quote section. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, I mean, we're already learning. Uh, there's been a lot of, of weird uh, is the Dark Tower a fictional work in the in the actual world stuff mm -hmm. and Charlie the Choo Choo and so forth. And Stephen King mm -hmm. is an actual person. And um, so... <laughs> him quoting himself here it, it especially considering our little trip to the manhattan restaurant of the mind uh I, i'm thinking maybe uh that he's being more than just a little bit cute here yeah yeah i mean uh, let's kind of close read this real quick because i do think it's interesting mm -hmm. first comes smiles then lies last is gunfire um i think that's really fascinating right like it's kind of like we, we got to remember that Roland is a politician. Yeah. Um, so first comes the smiles and then the lies and then last is gunfire. So we're going to try to be nice and then we're going to be untrue. And then if none of that works, we're going to we're going to shoot you. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it reminds me of, you know, baby shoes for sale, never worn or whatever, where it's it's mm -hmm. it's sort of it sort of begs to be uh, to be interpreted. You know, you're like, OK, mm -hmm. what what is the situation that this quote pertains to? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the, the honest truth is. I don't I believe I tried to research this. I didn't do enough of a detail, but I don't believe we've ever actually heard Roland say this. No, I don't. I, I think I would remember it if he said this mm -hmm. specific thing. I don't think he ever said that. I mean, he might later, but yeah, I mean, we don't know. Right. Yeah. This could be a quote from the future right. in the book, or it could be just in the in the annals of Roland's past. Right. He said this at one point. We don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is, yes, interesting. <laughs> the, the, there's a lot. OK, I'm just going to say right now, there's a lot in this in this week's reading where where i'm not gonna have much to say beyond well that's intriguing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh just because it's like yeah i mean th things are things are moving at this pace and there's there's not a lot of concrete answers so yeah i mean these are the setup chapters yeah. that's that's the part of the book we're in right now so i think that's totally fair yeah um 
the last one is a, a quote from a song, actually. So the song quote is the blood that flows through you flows through me. When I look in any mirror, it's your face that I see. Take my hand, lean on me. We're almost free. Wandering boy. So this is from a 2001 song called Wandering Boy by Rodney Crowell. Um, I'm not that into country music myself, but I actually like had the song on repeat while I was prepping for this week's show. And it like really gets into your head. And I think it's actually a song that's worth worth a listen, even if you're not huge into country. Um, my interpretation of the song is that it's a, about a pair of twin brothers, one of whom it seems like is gay. Um, he's sick and dying and returning home to his estranged brother who uh, seems was homophobic in the past. Um, that's the guy who's singing. And he's dealing with the choices that led to their estrangement and, and pledging to be with his brother until the end, until he's gone. Um, and I, I mean, I don't think. I don't think that King picked it because of that, right? I don't think that specifically that relationship has anything to do with what King picked. But I do think it's really interesting here because he kind of cheated because I, I I told you I listened to the song a bunch and I looked at the lines a bunch and he he picked lines from the song and just put them together. Mm-hmm. So the first four lines in here are from the second verse of the song. So the blood that flows through you flows through me. When you look when I look in the, any mirror, it's your face that I see. Um, that is from the first the second verse then the next three lines are kind of from the third verse but he changed them Mm -hmm. (laughs) so the actual song says lean on me i'll be strong we're almost free it won't be long wandering boy but king changed them to take my hand lean on me we're almost free wandering boy the phrase Take my hand does not exist in the song. I, I did a control find. I look like he didn't even take it from a different part and just plug it in here. It's just not in the song. Um, and then he removed the it won't be long and the I'll be strong parts of it, um, which is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so there, there's two things you can do with this, Matt. One is we learn in this week's episode that the song Hey Jude in Roland's version of Midworld does have a different line in it. So is this the Midworld version of the song Wandering Boy that we're seeing here on the page? I don't know. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> oh, is that just yes? <laughs> uh, I mean, no, it's definitely it's definitely interesting i mean but that's the thing even if it is just oh this is the mid-world version of the song okay why is it different Mm -hmm. why does it have this particular difference why did he take those words out why did he put these words words in yeah yeah i mean i kind of want to get meta with this i i think that this is stephen king talking about roland here right like the same blood i created you we are the same when i look in the mirror it's roland i see take my hand lean on me we're almost free as if to say Trust me, my old friend, we're almost at the finish line. We're doing this together. We're going to get there. It's almost over. This is my this is my magnum opus, my story that I've 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 been working on my entire life. And we're almost at the end now. And so I, I, I'll I'll lead us home. It's finally almost over. So to be clear, you think it's Stephen King talking to his character, Roland. Or, or Roland you talking could to reverse Stephen it. King. This is Roland talking to Stephen King. Stephen King, who's hurt after his accident, yeah. recovering, um, is looking his morality in the face for the first time. And he's looking to his old friend Roland, who he's been with his entire life. And Roland is saying, lean on me, old boy. I've got you. I'll take you home, Stephen King. I'll take you home. Yeah, I love that. I, I don't know if I would have thought of either of those things, but I, I love that. I, I like that quite a lot. Um, I mean, I, I was, I was going not that deeply. Um, I was just thinking brotherhood is a thing that the story has a lot to say about. We sort of got Roland and Eddie and Eddie and Jake serving as like surrogate brothers to each other at times. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, Eddie's relationship with Henry comes up a lot. Roland's relationship with his old quartet could be considered to be like a band of brothers. Yeah. Um, I mean, this, this is, this seems like it's going to be a story where we have this concept of twins occurring sort of everywhere like everyone is a twin um and this and like you said it's a it's a song about twin brothers right yeah um so that's the most literal interpretation obviously uh absolutely so uh which yeah um that's there there's there's kind of a clear literal interpretation but I, i really like your more um uh thematic interpretation yeah yeah well we will revisit these quotes in um about 11 weeks and we'll see We'll see if we learned anything new All throughout right. the course of the book. So speaking of the book, we're 25 minutes into our podcast. I think it's time to begin the book. Uh, two hours, two hours. 
it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. So we begin our prologue, which is titled Runt. And I think I've said this on the show before, Matt. I am not very into prologues. Like, I, I generally don't like prologues. I'm, I'm not a fan of them in general. Just get to the log and stop with the whole pro thing, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah, I think I wrote like a, a mini essay about why I didn't like prologues at one point, um, mm-hmm. um, because I think they're prone to specific failure modes. Yeah. That being said, I really fucking love this prologue. Mm-hmm. I think it's great. I really do think it's great. And I think it's great because it's setting up so much stuff. It's doing things that the king's basic mode of of storytelling has been to stay locked in on our content generally we cut we break off occasionally but in in the book proper we're pretty locked in on one of our five central characters um and so this prologue allows him to cheat that a little bit and and set up this whole world before our characters have even walked into it and i think it makes this a very satisfying exploration of what what Calibrine Sturgis is. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's 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 really cool. I liked it a lot. Yeah, yeah, me too. I, I mean, the, the main failure mode that I remember uh, pointing out is that a lot of fantasy prologues in particular uh, are just like, here's cool shit, cool shit, cool shit, cool shit, wizards yeah. and, and, and magic. And and isn't this weird? And it's like, I don't know, I feel like past a certain age, that just that doesn't do it for me anymore. Yeah, yeah. The thing about this is um, it's mostly just uh situations and characters and tension and drama and yeah this very interesting tn character that we get to learn about um, yeah i i do like that like a, a lot of what i the problems i have with prologues is they kind of toss you into the deep end and just like fling words and phrases and things at you with no explanation um and and their excuse is well it's the prologue the book hasn't started yet mm-hmm. so you don't need to understand everything going on here and the thing that's so interesting about this prologue to me is king does that same thing too he throws this into the deep end we meet this tian we don't know what rune to me is we don't know who the wolves are we don't know where this place is we don't know why we're here or what's happening he throws us in the deep end but he also in my opinion kind of expertly guides us to the shallow end of the pool he he allows us to understand this stuff slowly over the course of the prologue where by the end of it i know exactly what he's doing and what's going on yeah i mean for me he he anchored us quickly enough that i was able to be like oh we're finally in end world we're finally Mm -hmm. in this location Mm -hmm. that we've been heading to we're finally going to get into the world building stuff that we've really been slow playing and i'm going to get some of the answers that i've been dying for and then instead of being like oh this is just a bunch of random words you're like okay okay we're finally we're at the destination. This is what I've been wondering about this whole time. Yeah, yeah. And he anchors the entire prologue on one of the most relatable emotions that exists, which is a, a parent concerned about the future of their children, right? Mm-hmm. Like that yeah. is even even if you don't have children of your your own, like like me, I think you can relate to that idea that to the, this gen, this human thing of there's a threat my family is in danger and I need to do something about it. So yeah, there's all these things we don't understand about this world yet, but emotionally we're anchored to Tien's character and what he cares about, which is just human. It's just human Mm -hmm. concerns. Yeah, exactly. Like I, I am, I am, this thing is happening now. I am going to lose at least two of my children and I'm tired and I'm not going to take it anymore. Mm -hmm. And we need to do something. Yeah. Yep. Cool. So that is the prologue. We open up the book and we meet Tian Jaffords, a farmer who will later learn is part of this small village called Calibrine Sturgis. Um, like you said, not in in world or mid world anymore, but in end world. Da-da. We're getting there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Tian is trying to plow the field. His family has referred to as son of a bitch, which is great. He's got three field names and the third one is son of a bitch. But I love it. It's a it's a son of a bitch, right? There are rocks and holes everywhere. But Tian, we learn, is hardworking and stubborn and tilling this land and growing a crop here will will help his family out and ease the life of his family. So he's doing it. And like we were just talking about the way in which King slowly rolls out the information here, we don't understand anything. And then we suddenly see that he's using his twin sister, Tia, in place of a a mule. Mm -hmm. But it's fine because she's ruined. Mm -hmm. And we're like. What does that mean? <laughs> um, I, I, I'm saying this now because it literally just occurred to me that Root basically sounds like a kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, yokel way of saying ruined. Yeah, that that was always my interpretation. Yeah, I never. They're I basically d- just saying ruined. Yeah, I never put it together until until 
hearing you say it out loud like that. But yeah, I, I get that now. Okay, cool. Yeah, so here's the quote. Tian therefore plowed with his sister in the traces. No reason not to. Tia was root, hence good for little else. She was a big girl. The root ones often grown to prodigious size, and she was willing. And and I think this is like really off-putting, right? Because sure. you're just like, you're doing what? You, you're you're treating your sister as a mule? Like and and I think like for a minute there, you might think that that Tia is just like suffering from a mental disability, um, like maybe like Shimi in the past. And this is what the the world of, of Calibrin Star just treats their mentally disabled citizens like. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, yeah. fuck, yeah. these people are awful. Yeah, this is worse than Hambry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and the truth, of course, is a little bit more complicated than that. But I do love the ways in which Tian is used to kind of establish how the world treats their root citizens. Um, Tian is a man who is like fiercely protective of his family. Like they, we'll see that throughout this entire prologue. That's that's what's motivating all his actions here. But he's he 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 yells at his sister. He treats her basically as if she's a donkey. He treats her like an animal that's misbehaving. Um, and it's it's really interesting. Yeah, it's a very interesting choice to start your pro your story with your prologue with because mm -hmm. Tian, um, he is shown behaving in ways that are not like clearly obviously good and virtuous <laughs> to say the least. I mean, he, he has his sister yoked up to pull the plow. We're not really sure why he says awful things to his sister when, when she gets li a little perturbed. Mm -hmm. um, he's got this kind of current of, of anger in him. And I think it, it would be really easy. Like maybe the difference of, of kind of a few sentences being added or taken away here and there for King to have painted Tian as, as a, a straight up villain, like a, just a, a bad dude. Um, but he does the opposite. He shows the good qualities that are that are deep within this guy, despite the hardships and kind of emphasizes like, OK, well, he's he's kind of he's kind of a rough fellow, but he's a rough fellow because he lives in a rough world. Yeah. Um, and uh, and and his good qualities shine through despite that. And I don't know, that just yeah. strikes me as like a very high difficulty level way of of, of doing your characters. Sure, sure. Because, I mean, I think we also see that he he does love Tia like he, yeah. he loves his sister. Um, it's just, they have this really complicated relationship with the Runt people, which are kind of like these walking remnants of this life they, they are forced to live under. Like yeah. these people are taken away and then they wander back and they're never the same. They're not, they're not, she, she is his sister, but she's also not his sister anymore. Right. Um, and it's just, I think, I think part of the way they treat them is, is their kind of citywide, like, coping mechanism mm -hmm. of this whole this whole terrible process for sure yeah i think that's one of the most interesting ideas of this book what strikes me again as a very stephen king thing is having the town has adapted to this weird terrible situation um and people have sort of compartmentalized away this terrible thing um and i mean we're basically we're just entering into the story on the moment where one character can no longer compartmentalize it away yeah yeah Totally. So Tian and Tia are interrupted in their work by Andy. Andy comes bringing them news. Andy, by the way, is a is a robot. Mm -hmm. He's a robot. Uh, I love this line. Why or how this silly thing had survived when all the rest of the robots were gone, gone for generations. Tian neither knew nor cared. You were apt to see him anywhere in the Kala. He would not venture beyond its borders, striding on his impossibly thin silver legs, looking everywhere, occasionally clicking to himself as he stored or perhaps purged? Who knew? Information. He sang songs, passed on gossip and rumor from one end of town to the other. A tireless walker was Andy the messenger robot, and seemed to enjoy the giving of horoscopes of all things. Although there was a general agreement in the village that they meant little. <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah, so here's Andy the robot, right? Um, like, Andy is just uh, we, we've set up this town this this western town like in the old west that's struggling to survive in this harsh terror harsh conditions and then king throws a robot into it <laughs> you know it's interesting because i'm i'm actually getting more more of a rohan vibe from this than i even was from uh from uh you know hambry just in the sense mm -hmm. that that these people are even more kind of technologically i mean i haven't seen much of the city yet to, to be honest but but uh but it, it doesn't feel that Western to me. That's just one one thing I was going to comment. Okay, um, gotcha. But uh, yeah, the robot thing, it's hilarious and, and great. <laughs> 
Of course, Andy has one other duty, Matt. He just seems to know when the wolves are coming and the wolves are coming 30 days from now. We learn. I I love the way King is doing this. We don't know what or who or why the wolves are right. We don't know anything about them. But the first thing we hear about the wolves, which are in the title of our book, is that they're coming. And we know through Tian's reaction that that's bad. They're Mm. coming from the thunderclap, which is a word we recognize. And their coming is bad. Yeah, we we recognize that word meaning, OK, we're close to Thunderclap. That's, mm-hmm. you know, maybe our heroes will want to go on to Thunderclap quickly and, and they get bogged down here. That's sort of the the standard way this plot line goes, you know, the the seven, the seven samurai sort of plot line. Right. Um, right. It, it made me wonder immediately when we learned about Andy, whether like uh, being a messenger for the wolves isn't the reason why he sticks around, actually. Um, but but who knows? Uh, mm-hmm. I, I thought it was kind of funny at how much energy i spent thinking about this robot <laughs> like like what does it mean that there's a robot here um and there's like what's funny is i spent all i spent a long time thinking about this robot and and we don't know anything about the robot so we know he's a robot we know his name's andy we know he delivers messages we know he enjoys horoscopes which reminds me of blaine loving riddles mm. so he's like fixated on a kind of kind of pu- cultural puzzle um yeah. And that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. It is interesting. I, I love the name Andy. It just seems <laughs> innocuous. And yeah, like it, it's 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 just a really fascinating choice that just like you're kind of you find him endearing, but also you're suspicious of him because he's a fucking robot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's great. And then he's trying to like he tells the news and then is trying to get Tien to learn his horoscope. Sure, you wouldn't like to hear your horoscope, Sai. I see bright coins and a beautiful dark lady, which, of course, is probably true. So now. Yeah. He's, yeah. I mean, the beautiful dark lady, we can we can make the assumption yeah. that that's Susanna. Right. right. Um, so we don't quite know what the bright coins are. So maybe he tells true horoscopes right i mean the the line before was there was a general agreement in the village that the horoscopes meant very little um but maybe we're we're learning here uh-huh. uh through king kind of winking at us that they're more true than the town believes yeah exactly that that was my thought yeah andy also tells tian of strangers up in the northwest along the path of the beam but tian has bigger things to worry about he doesn't care about any of them um we actually get two mentions of the old fella here in this early section but we have no idea who he is yet just another question we're kind of wondering as we move through this prologue yeah i was waiting for some indication that our kata was going to enter the story and of course here it is Mm -hmm. um i immediately i immediately assumed this was them um and and so I was able, you know, from this relatively early point in the story to start getting excited about like the impending arrival of the gunslingers of, of these these total badasses. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and so once again, I, I, I admire this. This is King's technique that we've that we've noticed many times where he kind of tips his hand as to what is coming in the story. And rather than, you know, spoiling the fun, it actually makes things more fun because now I'm like, oh, OK, I, I get it. They're 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 nearby and they're going to come into play somehow. Yeah, I guess this is where I ask you <laughs> the people following Roland and his quartet. Like, do you have any guesses about do you think that's these people or do you think that's someone else? I mean, I, I guess if I had to bet on it, I'd say it was these people. But then my immediate thought is, well, why wouldn't they just approach them like what like they've been following them they've been like shadowing them for like days yeah but they're really bad at it they're really bad at it but why not just approach them like what why well that's that's what that's what makes me doubt that it is just these people because if it was if it was these people i would think that they would just be like you know hello i I am not confirming nor denying i am just asking the question because i knew you were probably wondering about it Um, yeah that was my that was my, my thought was like well i don't know who else it could be because mm-hmm. like I can't think of any other groups of people who it could be, but um, yeah. but the, but it could be these people, yeah. So Tian returns to his wife Zalia and tells her the news of the wolves, and this is when we learn, I, I think, the biggest piece of information here that in this town, for some reason, most people are twins, um, and they seem to be uh, uh, fraternal twins, not identical twins, because yeah. it's usually boy girl, right? Because yeah. Tian and Tia, and then Zalia. Uh, has her brother um whose name zalman um 
And so we learn that everyone's a twin, except there's rare singletons, they're called. And so Tian and Zalia have two sets of twins, Hedda and Hedden, and Lyman and Laia, and then one singleton, Aaron. And they say he will always be safe. He will, and, and, and again, we're like, wait, why? Why will he? And so we learn here that the wolves come, they take one of the twins, and then they eventually return Runt. And so we see Zalman and Tia were unfortunately the two that were picked 20 uh, years ago. Um, and now they're coming again to take his kids. Mm-hmm. So, so Tian is basically like, I can't, I can't stand it and I won't, I won't stand it no more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because the story is definitely so far hasn't told us what's going on here, but eventually they say like, Oh, there's vampires and, and you're like, okay, well they're taking a kid <laughs> and they're returning the kid you could say like without their self or without their soul or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so it's like, okay, this is some kind of vampirism, some kind of soul vampirism. And they're, they're doing something with these kids minds. Um, and I yeah. mean, th- that much is sort of, uh, I, w- I want to say obvious and, and then I'm going to be wrong, which is going to be funny, <laughs> but that much is sort of obvious from this point. But, it, but what, what it does though, is it doesn't really answer. It just makes you think like, okay, well, what's going on? What, what exactly right. is going on? Right. I mean, I think two questions immediately spring to mind, right? Like one, why is everyone here having twins? Right. Two, why are they only interested in the twins? And why are they only interested in one of the twins? Right. And, and what do they do with you know, what, what are they really getting out of it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Cause obviously it's for a reason. Yeah. Um, and these people have forced, have been forced to live under generations without knowing the reason, just knowing that they don't have a choice in the matter. Yep. So Tian, one of the smartest in the Kala, um, one of the few who can actually write, it says, decides to call a town gathering together. And I love this little, this little setting scene setting that King does here. The Kala's gathering hall stood on the end of the village high street beyond Took's general store and eater corner from the town pavilion, which was now dusty and dark with the end of summer. Soon enough, the ladies of town would begin decorating it for reap, but they'd never make a lot of re- they never made a lot of reaping night in the Kala. Children always enjoyed seeing the stuffy guys thrown on the fire, of course, and the bolder fellows would steal their share of kisses as the night itself approached. But that was about it. Your fripperies and festivals might do for midworld and inworld, but this was neither. Out here, they had more serious things to worry about than reaping day fairs. Things like the wolves. I really like that King is drawing this line here. Like, he knows we're coming from book four, where we saw Hambry, and we saw the, the that reaping night was such a big part of these people's lives that they, like, murdered a woman because they were disappointed <laughs> that they didn't get it. Right. Um, and, and so, like, this place is not Hambry. This is a different part of the world. This is a different place. These are different people. We are not want, we're not supposed to be drawing a line between Magus and, and Calibrine Sturgis. Yeah. I, I, I immediately thought like, Oh good. When, when he thinks to himself that they're just not really big ones for the reap. I was like, Oh good. They're, they're, you know, they've got to deal with literal monsters out here. They've got no time for this human sacrifice business. Yeah, yeah, totally. One more thing about that passage you just read is it's Tuke's general store. You know, t- t- it's it's another Tolkien word. Yeah, yep. Um, yep. Which I doubt anything more than the reference will come of it. But King definitely seems to enjoy lightly peppering his book with uh, names from Lord of the Rings. Just, just for you specifically, Matt. Yeah, just reminding us that this <laughs> is not that I'm not just making all this shit up. <laughs> nobody says you're making it up matt everybody loves it (laughs) we're good all right so many people show up to the gathering and tian outlines his plan which finally like gives the us the last of the missing pieces of the puzzle the wolves come usually once a generation 23 years ago was the last time we learn that they ride silver horses and they are not human but that's really all we know about them at this point exciting (laughs) We we finally meet some Manny as well, Matt. This is a group of, of people we've heard about since the Gunslinger. We've been hearing about the Manny, but we've never really seen them. Yeah, at last, right? Mm-hmm. What's funny is it never really occurred to me to wonder what the Manny were like. I just kind of assumed they were Christians. Yeah. Um, but of course, it's a twist on it. Like they, yeah. they talk about the Bible, they talk about Jesus, but they they're they're off. You know, yeah. they 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 do it weird. Um, yeah. and I'm sure that we've only scratched the surface of, of the differences. 
Yeah, I mean, let's remember these are the people that are supposedly able to just travel from world to world, mm-hmm. right? Um, th- as we'll learn later through Todesh. Mm-hmm. But this is this is our introduction to what the Manny are like. Hear what the book of the of Manny says: When the angel of death passed over Egypt, he killed the firstborn in every house where the blood of of sacrifice lamb hadn't been daubed in the doorpost. So says the book. Praise the book, said the rest of the Manny. So their plan here, Matt is just let's just murder all the children and then when the wolves come they won't have any to take Uh uh-huh yeah this is surprising there's this there's a certain (laughs) lack of i don't know humanity uh (laughs) to to these manny um it did my brain didn't this this feels dumb to even admit but the the idea that they say egypt clearly uh, egypt yeah, but yeah. it's been it, it's yet another thing that's been kind of contorted by the the passage between worlds and what have you. I wonder if that's just a symptom of the audiobook, right? Because I think like seeing it written out, I think you can kind of get to Egypt. But I think if I was just listening to someone talk and I heard, I would just have heard nonsense word and then moved yeah. on. It does remind me that apparently uh, uh, Arthur Eld has like pyramid iconography. Mm-hmm. So yeah. maybe there's some Egypt connection here yeah. as well who knows we'll, we'll find out or not so there's a there's a ton of arguing back and forth in this section Matt. i love how we kind of see like this book is really endearing us to tn we see his strength as an orator and a politician like the most vocal voices preaching that they should just let things happen as they always do are also those who happen to be the eldest without any children in danger of being taken and tn pounces on this he capitalizes on this um they consider a lot of things they consider running out west but they fear they'd be found out or the town would be burned and tian kind of finishes his big speech on each time they come and take our children they take a little more of our hearts and our souls um it's it's really great yeah it's such a good speech right it's such and i love i love the build up to it where it's like i don't know king just perfectly captures the feeling of having to give um, a speech that, uh, you know, an, an impromptu speech, but also the feeling of like, well, he knows exactly what he thinks about this. And so w- w- where he normally might feel nervous, um, he doesn't in this case. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we learn a little bit more about the wolves too. We, they have fire hurling weapons, light sticks and guns and flying metal things called either buzz balls or sneeches or stealthies. We had no idea what these things yeah, are. I, I imagine that King wrote down those three words and was like, which of these should I use? And he's like, oh, let's use all three. <laughs> um, I, I'm enjoying how King has primed us to expect like that this is a technological world so mm-hmm. that when you hear like, okay, they've got gray horses, maybe they're like robot horses, but then, you know, and, and they clearly use high tech weapons, but then like maybe, maybe not because there's also clearly magic in the world too. And, sure. and so it's fun that King has, has, has kind of kept us off balance so much that, I can't just safely jump to one conclusion and think, oh, these are just like some kind of technological terror or, oh, these are just orcs. Like I, I really, I will have to see them to make up my mind. And, and yeah. I, I like that. that. That's, that's more fun for me. Sure. Sure. Yeah. They, they're, they are a mystery and, and we can, we can see like fire hurling weapons. Is that just an explosive? Like, what does that mean? What is that? We don't, we just don't know. Right. Um, but yeah, they are this cool, mysterious. I think the thing it absolutely does is make us understand that these things are fearsome and deadly. And it's not that these people just were rolling over and taking it. Like they, they really felt like they did just didn't have a choice. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're the fighting Urukai. You can't stand up to them. <laughs> Um, so the talk goes back and forth and, and most of the people want to stop the wolves. They want to stand up to them, but they're too scared and they don't know how to fight and they don't have weapons. So they don't know what to do. And then suddenly the man in black at the back of the room with the scar on his head finally speaks. This is Per Callahan or the old fella that we heard mentioned earlier in the chapter. Um, and then the book transfers over to Callahan's point of view as he speaks. And he says, I know a bit about cowardice. May it do you? Callahan said, turning to the men on the benches. He raised his right hand, misshapen and twisted by some old burn, looked at it fixedly, then dropped it to his side again. I have personal experience, you might say. I know how one cowardly decision leads to another and another and another until it's too late to turn around, too late to change. Mr. Telford, I assure you the tree in which young Mr. Jafford spoke is not make-believe. The Kala is in dire danger. Your souls are in danger. So this is, this is Perry Callahan, Matt. 
um yeah um cool i'm glad he's here <laughs> he seems interesting uh yeah very curious about him we'll talk about more about him in a second but what we do learn here is that callahan has spoken to andy who told him of the people coming from Outworld to the Northwest. They're gunslingers, he says, and Callahan thinks they should hire them. You want hard calibers? They're at hand. So here is a solution to their problem. They want to stand against the wolves, but they're too afraid, and they don't have the means to do it. Well, look what Ka has brought you. Ka has brought you a quartet of gunslingers coming your way, and uh, and they will have what it takes. So, um, so we're going to hire some gunslingers. It's great. I think I think you want hard calibers there at hand is yet another great line that's just going to so stick good. with me forever. Yeah. Uh, and before we leave our prologue, we learn a little bit more about Callahan. He we learn that he's got something under the floorboards of his church that he thinks Roland and his tet will want quite a bit. But there's something else we learn here, Matt. He's he was run away from a town called Jerusalem's lot in another world mm -hmm. um, and this is when i tell you matt that father callahan is a character from king's second novel salem's lot a book about vampires taking up residence in a small new england town uh, we will have a lot more to say about callahan in the future but for now that's all you need to know he was a character in that book and so when he is holding up his burnt hand and when he is talking about past mistakes and past cowardice he is referencing uh salem's lot awesome and, you know, it, it, it already seems to me like, OK, this guy's obviously going to be important to the plot, like in a, in a lot of ways. I mean, j just mm -hmm. just first of all, based on the fact that he's obviously an, another Earthican um, <laughs> for our Earthican characters to meet. I, I think another thing that's interesting to me is like a lot of the kind of other interbook connections like Martin being Randall Flagg kind of struck me as like more of an easter egg it's like oh cool yeah. that, that's that's neat the bad guy but it doesn't really seem to matter that much while while i think like the fact that this is a character from specifically salem's lot with like his own specific things that he that he knows about and did in that book that seems more more central more like it'll matter and not just kind of be a neat factoid i think one thing you'll see as as if you look back over these past five books as king has gone he has increased the other book connections from occasional references and Easter eggs all the way to this moment now where this is just a character from one of his books in this book. Um, so it has, it has it, it, the, the connection to the Stephen King universe is, is taking a more central role in the story. Um, does this mean you have to read Salem's lot before you read this book to understand what's going on? No. Um, I, I had, I'm trying to remember if I had read Salem's Lot when I read this book the first time. I don't think I had. I don't think I had. Um, I don't think the book is written with the the implicit understanding that you, the reader, had read Salem's Lot in the past. Um, it se it seems like it'd be a lot to ask, frankly. Yeah, we. I mean, we will talk about Callahan a lot more in the future and and about his experience in the past and how that has informed who he is right now and what he is doing right now these will be things we will we will talk about as we get through the story so i just wanted to introduce this to you because like it, it just it's it's a moment in the book that feels like it's referencing stuff if and and i was worried that if you didn't know that it was indeed that you would just be really confused well when he said jerusalem jerusalem was lot i was i got that that was salem's lot and then I okay. was like, okay, this is a character from another thing. But okay. I don't know anything else Good. about it, though. So. Well, that's all you need to okay. know. All right. So, Matt, we're basically in the Seven Samurai, <laughs> right? Yep. Or if you want to get technical, the plot of The Magnificent Seven, um, which is John Sturgis's Western remake of, the Se of Seven Samurai. It's basically the same plot. Basically, the plot is a small town is having trouble with a group of bandits or an enemy army, and they hire a team of outlaws slash samurai to help them fight back against the enemy and protect the town. That is the plot of those stories, and that seems like what we're doing here. And all the samurai slash outlaws end up totally fine, don't they? Oh yeah, for sure. Okay, for good. Sure, all like all of them. Good. Yeah. Hey, wait did you did you skip over when somebody said Gilead fell a thousand years ago? Uh, oh, yeah. I'm just gonna quote. This time, Overholzer made it all the way to his feet. His face burned as if with a fever. His great pod of a belly trembled. What children's good night story is this? He asked. If there ever were such men, they passed out of existence with Gilead, and Gilead has been dust in the wind for a thousand years. <laughs> so. Yeah. 
time man time you know we were talking about this earlier like i'm like okay well the simple explanation is that time just moves slower closer to the tower but i don't think like i don't think it can possibly be as simple as that um something weird's happening with time we've known that forever it does surprise me to hear that for these people it was a thousand years oh no sorry time must move faster closer to the tower so mm-hmm. for these people it's been a thousand years so so either either roland has been wandering for a thousand years and he's a thousand years old or mumble mumble something i don't know yeah i mean we uh, there has been this interesting thing where the time that roland was chasing martin has always been a little fuzzy yeah and and the time that roland and and martin spent in in palaver at the end of gunslinger has always been a little fuzzy as well we said he looked like 10 years older but he didn't know how much time had gone by and I think like, you know, you talked last year where Roland talked about centuries and here we're talking about a thousand years. I think what King is doing is just making making explicit the fuzziness that was always there from the beginning. We never really we never really understood exactly how much time had passed and, and what was going on here. And I think he's just kind of putting it in the text more now mm-hmm. that explicitly Roland has been around for a long time yeah. um, and he's it doesn't even seem like he's sure why that is either mm-hmm. but um yeah but it is the truth yeah okay cool yeah all right so we are out of the prologue the wonderful prologue and now we move into the first chapter of the book chapter one the face on the water um we're back with our our quartet and, and we're in eddie's point of view this chapter as he conveniently muses about the plot of the series so far to remind us the reader about what has happened in the past four books Very helpful. Yeah, it's very helpful, unless except for you and me, who have been spending way too much time reading these books. Uh-huh. Um, Eddie, Mun- Eddie also mentions the time, which has always been kind of funny in Midworld, has truly become unglued now. Ever since they got out of the Crystal Palace, they've been basically walking for about five uneventful weeks since we last saw them, which is like, if you want to get meta about this, it's like, well, the book wasn't happening, so <laughs> time wasn't moving. So now that we've opened the book again time is back uh, that's great yeah yeah the the plot wasn't happening so Ka kind of lapsed in its attention mm-hmm. i love this little bit about roland's love of stories from earth um they're talking about i think the story of hansel and gretel and roland immediately asks to be told the story and, and eddie thinks to himself of course he would the man was a glutton for stories especially those that led off with a once upon a time when everyone lived in the forest but the way he listened was a little odd a little off. Eddie had mentioned this to Susanna once, and she'd nailed it with a single stroke, as she often did. Susanna had a poet's almost uncanny ability to put feelings into words, freezing them into place. That's because he doesn't listen all big-eyed like a kid at bedtime, she said. That's just how you want him to listen, honey bunch. And how does he listen? Like an anthropologist, she had replied promptly. Like an anthropologist trying to figure out some strange culture by their myths and legends. I love this because Roland takes stories and storytelling so seriously. It's all it's not just about entertainment. It's about clues and hints about something, anything, whatever. It's it's a it's a window into a culture. Yeah, it reminds me of his focus on riddles, too, how he doesn't just think of them as neat. He thinks of them as useful. They're tools to training yeah. the mind, understanding and yeah. stories are, are a way of finding out about people's. But it seems like there's even more to it beyond that in the in this story about stories where, you know, they, they just run across like, oh, it's it's literally the Emerald City. It's it's red shoes that we have to click the heels like right. it, it's it's valuable to know about stories in a world where you just fall into the Wizard of Oz suddenly. Potentially, I don't know. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think that maybe this is specifically learned behavior from that last experience. Remember when he was so frustrated that he didn't know what was going on with the Wizard of Oz and he's like, I can't let this happen again. Yeah. I need I need to know all these stories. Right. Yeah. I mean, it might even have literally occurred to him, like if I had asked them more about their stories before, then I wouldn't have, might not have been caught off guard by that. Yeah. Yeah. And so then they start kind of musing about what a fairy tale is. And Roland hilariously says, there's no fairy in it. (laughs) Yeah. But they basically say, oh, no, it's like a genre. And they start talking about story flavors. And Roland says, do people in your world always want only one story flavor at a time? Only one taste in their mouths? I guess that's close enough. Susanna said, does no one eat stew? Roland asked, get him get him it's so good i love this so much <laughs> you know because king is having the characters say out loud something that we've talked a lot about yeah the, the dark tower is this playground that king has made and he, he mixes and matches genre 
um, to such amazing effect that you, you do indeed wonder like, hey, why don't we see more of this kind of thing? This is awesome. I love this. Yeah, yeah. And Genre then, is, a, is yeah. a tool. And yeah. if you if you want to get, you can you can make a stew. This is a delicious stew. I mean, that's mm-hmm. that, that's the thing. I think I was trying to sell the Dark Tower to somebody recently. And one yes, of my sales, good, good. one of my, <laughs> yeah, well, and one of my sales, like, like the, the, the way I chose to frame it was like the fun and unique thing about it is that it, it jumps between genres in a way that's extremely fun. And that's that, that so that was the most salient thing to, it, to my mind when I was trying to sell it. Um, oh, that's great. That's great. I, I think that is exactly what he's going for here. And, and you're right that having, having Roland be his mouthpiece for this particular complaint. I mean, I, I, I wonder I wonder if he like read a review or a critique of his stories that was just like, I wish it would just pick a genre. <laughs> and he's like, I'll show you pick a genre. Like, I don't I don't know if Stephen King is that vindictive, but I do think every creator wrestles with the the writing of their critic at some point. Right. Uh, it's just, it's just going to happen. Or, or even just, I mean, reframe, say, like somebody at a book, sign, or, you know, maybe 100 people at book signings were like, what's the deal with with you? switching between genres do you do you notice you're doing that and he's like i have to some, put somewhere in the book that i'm doing it on purpose or they're gonna <laughs> not understand that i'm doing it on purpose i like that better because it makes him a little less vindictive <laughs> I, I mean we we know that we know that writers of long things will 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 pay attention and be like okay people are just not getting this thing that i'm trying to do and i, I thought it was obvious mm-hmm. but i'm just gonna have the characters have a conversation about it so that it's even more obvious that's great that's great all right matt it is time to talk about the mystery number nine. Our quartet in the in the intervening weeks has been noticing something some some unusual behavior around this mystery number. We really haven't seen nineteen um, since Tull, since it was the number that you ought not say because it will you will be told about what is beyond death back in Tull, right? Mm-hmm. But now they see it everywhere. They looked at each other and laughed because 19 had become kind of a jokey catchword amongst them, replacing bum hug, which Jake and Eddie had pretty much worn out. Yet the laughter had a tinge of uneasiness about it because this business about 19 had gotten a trifle weird. Eddie had found himself carving it in the side of his most recent wooden animal, like a brand. Hey there, pard. Welcome to our spread. We call it the bar 19. Both Susanna and Jake had confessed to bringing wood in for the evening fire in armloads of 19 pieces neither of them could say why it just felt right to do it that way somehow then there was the morning roland had stopped them at the edge of the woods through which they were now traveling he had pointed to the sky where one particularly ancient tree had reared its hoary branches the shapes those branches made against the sky was the number 19 clearly 19 they had all seen it but roland had seen it first 19 what do you make of it uh, I mean, I know it's very important to Stephen King because it was the age that he was when he started writing the story. I don't really know beyond that anything. Like, why is it, why is it in the story? Why is it so prominent? Why is it so magical? Why is it so meaningful? Don't know any of that. I know, you know, I, I think it has to do with the creator's unusually direct relationship with his creation here where sure. it's, not just, it's not just the story he wants to tell. It's sort of about the fact that he wants to tell it. Mm-hmm. Um but I feel like this is the book where we're going to learn a little bit more about that. Cause so far I don't even remember it being mentioned uh, other than, you know, you know, just p- passing very minor sort of meaningless seeming references. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I have, I have highlighted a few of them, um, mm-hmm. like the number of, um, of well, oil. Well heads, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, it has never, it has never taken center stage in the story until this moment. Um, yeah. But we, yeah, we don't really know why or anything about it. Um, it's just just fun little mystery number stuff. Yep. It's prime. It's, it's prime. It's prime. And see, that's the thing is, I think I like, I think I started reading the argument where King talks about the fact that he was 19 and then I stopped because I was like, oh, I don't know if I should be reading this. Mm. So I don't know if there's Good like choice. more clues in there. Okay. No, don't, don't read that. Okay. Don't read that. Yep. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I won't. Um, so Jake stumbles upon a big clearing full of muffin balls, (laughs) berry like things that taste and smell like freshly baked rye bread. I I, I want, I want these. Yeah. I want some of these real bad. Um, Eddie says he refused to eat them because it reminds him of the book. We have always lived in the castle, a Shirley Jackson story he read as a kid in which a woman poisoned her family with with muffin ball looking things Mm -hmm. (laughs) one day matt we're just gonna have a show that's just us reading and discussing all the non-stephen king books discussed in the dark tower because we could we could 
podcast for eternity about that. Cause yeah. It's a lot of stuff. As, lo- as long as we don't like, as long as we stick to one level of recursion and then do it, we don't have to cover all of the things that are referenced in the wasteland, the poem, the wasteland. Oh yeah. Cause yes. No, then, we're not doing that. Then we, <laughs> yeah. That would literally be a, a, a life's work. Yeah. I mean, it, it's an interesting story to pick here. There's, there's a lot of themes and we have always lived in the castle that I'm kind of afraid to go into too much. Cause I don't know if it's going to accidentally reveal more about this book, but all I'll say about it is if if all Eddie Dean got from it was this chick poisoned her family, which it's just like he didn't pay attention in literature class very much. <laughs> well, having never even heard of that book. Uh, yeah, sure. Eddie, you idiot. I think one thing you'll learn about King, the more you kind of read about him as a person is he has he loves Shirley Jackson. Um, he loves Shirley. Jackson yeah. So that's the that's the uh, didn't Susanna make a reference to Shirley Jackson relatively recently? Yeah, I think so. Was it the lottery? I think I it was like the lottery. Yeah, everyone in, references it, the lottery. In, yeah, in Lud, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, in, in that book, Dance Macabre, like he spent, he spends basically an entire chapter talking about how brilliant Shirley Jackson was. So he really, really likes Shirley Jackson. Awesome. All right, so they also recognize that they are being followed by another group, five, maybe six people. We don't find out this week who this group is or what they want, but you and I have already talked about our suspicions that this may be people from the Cala, but we're not sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I really, I want to focus on this bit a bit here, so where Roland says, since yesterday, cut in from behind us almost dead east. And you didn't tell us, Susanna asked. She spoke rather sternly, not bothering to cover her mouth and obscure the shapes of her words. Roland looked at her with the barest twinkle in his eye. I was curious as to which of you would smell them out first. Actually, I had my money on you, Susanna. She gave him a cool look and said nothing. I think this is really cool because we have talked about how observant and aware Susanna is. And Susanna did not sniff out these other people. It was actually Jake who noticed them first. And I think this um, this does a couple things. I think this is king giving us our first hint of that not all is well with Susanna dean like she, maybe she's not as sharp as she normally is because she didn't notice these people but i also wonder if this is roland kind of testing her a little bit he knows about we, we find out later that he knows about these nightly sleepwalks she's going on um and so maybe he's saying this to kind of like gauge her reaction here and kind of kind of test what what's going on with her because he's just not sure what to make of anything that's happening with her yeah, I mean, I didn't I definitely didn't catch the the subtlety of what's going on here. But now that now that I'm looking at this with the benefit of seeing what happens to her later, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting. I, I like I, whether you whether conscious or not, I do think it primes you for something's going on with Susanna. And, and definitely not what we expect when we get to the Mia chapter. But for something. sure. <laughs> All right, so the group sets up camp and eats their fill of muffin balls, even Eddie, because he gets so hungry and they smell so good. And then they all go to sleep, and Eddie wakes up in a dream of New York City. But also, it's not a dream. It's that it, it's real. It's a weird thing. What? <laughs> oh, another thing is I don't. Uh, I I feel like I'm missing like the, this chapter is called the face in the water, but I'm not understanding what the reference to the face in the water. It was. Yeah, I mean, that's a good that's a good point. I mean, it's just the very beginning of the chapter, right? Like the very, very beginning of the chapter is. um, Yeah, is is Eddie looking Eddie talking about a face in the water? Okay. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. that 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 dimly recall that. Whoops. Okay. I was I was trying to to buy time as I brought it up in my copy of the book that's sitting right here in front of me, but I was not fast (laughs) enough. But um yeah, time is a face on the water. This was a proverb from a long ago and far off magus. Eddie Dean had never been there. So time is a face on the water. Okay, um, I get it. That, so that's what that's what Eddie's thinking about. I mean, this like chapter one is kind of talking about time and how time has been foobarred and, and yeah. stuck. Um, so time is a face on the water. Gotcha. But what does that mean? What does time is a face on the water mean, Matt? <sighs> I don't know. I mean, other than the fact like a face on the water usually refers to a, a distorted reflection yeah but it's like okay well if time is a distorted reflection what does that mean <laughs> I, don't, I don't know I, I'm, I'm having trouble with that one honestly let's, let's think about it maybe we'll circle back okay to okay it. for now let's move on to chapter two titled new york groove and i think we're gonna understand what this chapter title means yep 
So we cut over to Jake's point of view now and we see how he got to New York City. He hears this brief chiming melody and then he's here and of Oi is here too of course jake explains that this is this feels kind of like when they were transported by merlin's grapefruit but still a little bit different somehow um we quickly learn that no one can see them jake and Oi are there and they're like walking around them as if they can sense them but they can't see them um and the text makes sure to really stress to us again king hits this beat multiple times that this is not a dream it it, it at first they think it's a dream but it's more intense and more textured and also it's a collective dream if it is because Oi and Eddie are there too. Right. Yeah. It, they, they really do seem to be there because of the way people like react to them too. And, yeah. and you know, like, yeah. So just overall, it's weird. It's weird. A lot of questions. <laughs> like there's some force repeatedly pulling our content members across space and time to basically this same location in the same time mm-hmm. um, because of, you know, something, something, the rose. We don't really understand. I, I mentioned before that like the three Katet members I, I do think that they were chosen because they have something particular to give to Roland like some some character based uh, 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 sort of message to impart on him but I think also plot wise you know these are three people from New York City the same earth at that very specific you know yeah. relatively close but not too close together points in time just kind of staggered out over a period of like 30 years or something like that uh so like the universe needs people specifically from this place in this time and needs them to do something here at this this place in this time and i think that that is we're, we're that is becoming evident because okay we we get that the rose is in this one lot and it it wasn't enough just to learn that the lot is there. We also now are learning, oh, there are people who have specific, you know, agendas against it. We saw the vision with the, the tractor or whatever smashing through the, the rows we saw. Mm-hmm. So um, I think I think like you said, we're seeing evidence like King is kind of wanting to bring that more into the focus of the plot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think you're right on there. So Eddie, Jake, and Oi casually notice there's a second Jake here wearing dockers and walking by them, and Jake realizes what day it is. As you said, it's May 31st, 1997, or 1977, the day that Jake went on French leave, the day he saw the rose. We're back on this all-important day, and, and this is when we realize that Adventures Endgame basically stole this entire, entire plot line from Stephen King. Oh my god. <laughs> So the trio follow other Jake as he makes his way down 2nd Street towards his run-in with the Rose, but they can tell something is wrong here. And this is the interesting thing about this, Matt, that something's wrong. Eddie thinks that there's, like, it's dark here. Like, he feels that it's dark, but it shouldn't be. He it shouldn't be able to see our shadows when it's this dark. Stupid thought. It wasn't dark. It was morning, for Christ's sakes. A bright May morning, sunshine winking off the chroma passing cars. And yet, it feels dark. Yet... Only he says here, only behind this canvas, you wouldn't find the workshop and storage areas of backstage, but only a great bulging darkness. So it feels like they're here, but they're on like a set like that. The, the, they're they're here for real. But here is a set. And beyond the the frame of the set is just unending darkness, a great bulging darkness, some vast dead universe where Roland's tower has already fallen. Yeah, this is some beautiful imagery and, and mm-hmm. emotions. Um, yeah. Yeah. And and we'll learn a little bit more about what is going on here. That we, we learn that this is called going toe dash uh, in a little bit later in the chapter. But I, I, again, appreciate how one of the things that all of these chapters collectively are doing is King is throwing us into the deep end and then filling us in on what just happened in the preceding uh, chapters, mm-hmm. um, which is just, I think it's a really delightful strategy here. And it's really made me enjoy my book, my read, even if I knew what was happening next. Mm-hmm. All right, Matt, time for it to get weird. All right. So the trio follow Jake into the Manhattan restaurant of the mind. We're back at this all important bookstore and they look at the sign out front and they see today's specials from Mississippi, pan fried William Faulkner from Maine, chilled Stephen King from California, hard boiled Raymond Chandler. Uh, one of these things is not like the others. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, and ju- just in case you forgot, um, this was not Stephen King. The first time Jake went into the store. Um, 
I forget who the other author was, but it, Faulkner is the same. Raymond Chandler is the same. Uh, this middle one here was someone else. It was not Stephen King. This is going to be a lot of, uh, huh, that's interesting <laughs> in, in this in this part of the book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, the funny thing about this is both of them look at it, and, and Jake says a little bit later in the chapter, that sign was different, but I can't remember how. Mm-hmm. Um, but they like, th- there's no like, who's Stephen King? Uh, we have to also remember that Eddie Dean knew what The Shining was, right. so maybe he's just like, oh yeah, Stephen King, of course. Yeah, I've always I've wondered. I think I mentioned before. I've wondered like, are are are, the, are are our characters actually from the same dimension, or are there slightly different dimensions? And I mean, just the fact that you see one one time the sign says one thing another time the sign says a different thing at least implies the time that you know the 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 time continuum was changed like weekly implies that anyway it could be a number of things right but i mean this we just saw jake in here right and jake that jake shouldn't have seen this sign so what's yeah what's up i don't know that a lot of a lot of me being confused here if anybody ever wants audio samples of a very confused man Please just use this <laughs> this episode of this podcast. I mean, here's the fun thing about this, though. Like in 1977, Stephen King had three books out. He had <laughs> Carrie, he had Salem's Lot, and he had The Shining. Uh-huh. And that, that was it. And he had a book called Rage, um, which was uh, a Richard Bachman book, which we're going to talk about Richard Bachman in a little bit. But um, I think that's interesting, right? Like he wasn't, I guess by I guess by that point, he was pretty big to the point where maybe he's going to be at this small, small Manhattan bookstore. I don't know. Well, if I'm reading Se- 75 cents for a Stephen King paperback and I, I don't know. I, 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 wanted, I can't, I wanted to mention that because like he gives himself hardcovers market price. Sure. Fine. Book club mm-hmm. bargains, paperback 75 cents each. I don't know what prices were like in, in the seventies, but that seems cheap. So is, is, is he is he sort of insulting himself in a in a in a subtle way like probably my books are are garbage and they're they're cheap or something <laughs> I mean it's a it's, it's a joke authors often make sure, um, sure. also it's funny because it's like okay okay from Maine chilled Stephen King lobster is from Maine chilled lobstrosities connection question mark <laughs> well maybe the reason why King wrote lobstrosities is because he lives in in Maine that's possible. <laughs> this is gonna be fun this is gonna be a fun book to read with you i'm gonna enjoy this um so we get to relive the conversation between deep now calvin tower and other jake or kid 77 as eddie calls him but uh weird differences keep happening matt the, the, this is not the same as it was before yeah like i said at this point i'm either thinking repeated time loops with small variations or different dimensions but i'm just gonna hold off because it's probably some even weirder that I can't even think about. Sure. What, besides the Stephen King being on the board out front, one of the other big changes is that the Charlie the Choo Choo book that uh, Jake 77 picks up is no longer written by Beryl Evans, but is now written by Claudia E. Inez Bachman. Um, Matt Bachman. What does that mean to you? I mean, it's King's pseudonym. Yeah. Richard, but that's Richard Bachman. So it is. So either Charlie the Choo Choo is being written by King under like a different pseudonym, pseudonym. But I mean, in reality, the actual real Charlie the Choo Choo book that exists was written by Stephen King uh-huh. under the pseudonym Beryl Evans, not the pseudonym Richard Bachman or Bar- in this one, Claudia Bachman. I'm so confused. <laughs> That's all I I'm got. enjoying this. I'm enjoying this. Um, <laughs> there's so many things I want to say and it's getting harder. It's getting harder <laughs> to know what to say and what not to say. Uh, well, at least we're both, uh, uncomfortable. <laughs> so the three leave the bookstore ahead of 77 Jake and decide that they want to go see the Rose right away. But for some reason, something is keeping them here. And as Jake walks away, a gray town car rolls up and out steps a 10 year younger motherfucking Enrico Balazar. <laughs> Holy shit. Yep. Um, crazy. <laughs> um, so I I picked up. But yeah. So anyway, um, I think it's increasingly interesting how 
much plot important detail king is slipping into the arguments at the end of, at the ends of the books and at the St- beginnings of the books, at yeah. the, and the beginning stuff stuff like martin equals walter is a confusion that as far as i can tell is purely introduced in the arguments mm-hmm. and stuff like enrico balazar was the one who ran over jake purely yeah. introduced in the arguments the the final argument at the beginning of this book says that it says enrico balazar was the one that ran over jake um and the, yeah i i that is not stated anywhere else. Um, maybe like King wanted you to put together context clues from like, maybe we saw Balazar's car and we were supposed to say that, Oh yeah, that's the same car. Maybe. But I, I mean, yeah. Cause Bal- the, the, the driver of the car is described in a lot of detail, but the description did not, does not like smack of, of Balazar to me. Sure. So. Sure. Sure. But I mean, I think that it, it's kind of showing us once again, that the world is shrinking kind of like the, all these all these people relate to all these people. We already had this with with the pusher, right? That, that this this was a guy related to multiple characters in our cotet. And now yeah. Balazar is related to multiple characters in our cotet. We have to bring back uh, coincidence. <laughs> it's great. It's great. So yeah. Balazar, Jake Andalini and George Biondi who are all characters we remember from way back in the drawing of the three are here and they're walking into Calvin Towers bookshop. Balladur is shaking down tower or Torin, as we learn his name used to be, but he changed it. That's, that probably means nothing. Uh-huh. Uh, it has something to do with a ten, a hundred thousand dollars, but we're not exactly sure what tower leaves Aaron in charge of the store as he goes back to talk with the gangsters. And this is where I can kind of tell you, Matt, um, Aaron deep now is actually related to a character named Ed from one of other one of King's other novels called Insomnia. We might cover that book one day, so I don't want to say too much about it, but it is one of if not the closest tie in to the Dark Tower out of all of King's novels. I think it if if I was doing our second season plan of what books we're going to cover after we finish that are related to the dark tower. It might be the one I start with or maybe the second one. Um, so it has a lot to do with dark towery stuff. Um, and it's pretty good. So we'll, maybe we'll read that one day, but all you need to know right now is that, that deep now is related to another character in another book and they're both back in our story now. That's not related to the Chris Nolan film. Is it what, uh, insomnia? No, no, it okay. is not. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I mean, I just figured Calvin. So, so, so uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hold off <laughs> my opinion on, on Aaron deep now for now. I guess. Yeah. I mean, here, here's what else like the, we had some people, um, this is actually something I wanted to talk to you a bit on because we had some people back, back when Aaron deep now showed up. In the book, we had some people that say, Scott, why didn't you mention to Matt that he's related to a character from Insomnia? And I made a choice not to because I didn't want I felt like if I start saying some like I feel like if I start saying things too early, sometimes it hints at stuff for you. Like when we first met Calvin Tower and Aaron Deep now, you could make an argument that these are just cameo characters that just are in this one scene with jake and then just go away and we never see him again right sure. yeah um i feel like if i start drawing connections and saying like no this is actually a character you know him. You'll, yeah. you'll hear this name and in this book then it starts to indicate that there's something deeper going on here with yeah. these characters and i didn't want to tip my hand towards that too early i could do it now because we've returned to these characters and basically this whole section is basically setting up the idea that Calvin Tower is intricately linked with the the lot that has the rose in it. Um, so we know these are important characters now, and I think it's fair to do it now. But like normally when I choose to withhold information from you, I'm doing it for a reason. Sure. Makes perfect sense to me. I, I mean, sometimes authors just cutely put characters from other books in their books and it's like, oh, that, oh mm-hmm. I, I recognize that. And you're sort of sort of a little Easter egg, a little reward for the for the reader um but and 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 it, like really emphasizing it though would have drawn my attention to it and then i would have been like yeah. huh this is well, well why why yeah yeah and i i like i i want i want you to be like i want to turn your your 
frame of reference towards certain things and certain ideas sometimes. But I don't want to I don't want to lead you too much. You know, I want you to experience some of the stuff. And that was a call I made. So if you're ever sitting there at home thinking, well, why didn't Scott mention this? Why didn't he say that? What? There's usually not always, but there's usually a reason why I've chosen to withhold that information um, at that point. Yeah. Um, so I'm on the that, same page, though. OK, yeah, it is. It, I mean, it's an interesting thing about this whole process we're doing, right? This whole close reading one person leading the other, right? Like when we did this with uh, the worm book that you and I read, I made some eerily accurate predictions and and I've long given this given the credit for that to you because i think you got my my brain on a frame of reference that could allow me to put puzzle pieces together um so like this kind of reading will never be like a person just sitting at home reading by themselves yeah just the stuff that that the that the you know experienced reader chooses to pull out to talk about tells you okay this is what this story is doing actually right right. um and it structures your thinking and also just having to talk about a book this much structures your thinking so. Yeah. Yeah. But but I, I, I do I do want to I, I want to hold your hand through this series. Obviously, that's kind of my role here. But I also don't want to I don't want to hold it too much. I want to give you enough room to really explore and wander yourself. Um, and that's things like that where I don't want to I don't want I don't want you to know about that character until it seems like the right time to know about that character. I don't want you to know about that little that little cute thing King did until it matters. Yeah. If you tell me too much, then, then I won't come up with harebrained, ridiculous theories <laughs> that everyone can laugh at. And that's half the fun. Sure. All right. Let's get back to it because uh, we're, we're coming up on our time here, Matt. Yep. So the gangsters take tower in the back and shut the door behind them, locking out Eddie and Jake. But it's fortunate that they can walk through fucking walls. Uh-huh. So they just walk through the walls yep. and they're in the back now. And, and King gives a, a really beautiful description of what the back of this bookstore looks like. And it's almost like otherworldly in its um, setup. Like it, it, it reminds me of like what a bookstore in a fantasy story would look like, like the stacks and stacks of books and, and places where the text says, I want these these stacks might be like holding up <laughs> the the store uh-huh. um they're not they're they're functional stacks of books they're load bearing that's funny yeah it's um, you sort of expect to find like the never-ending storybook in here somewhere yeah yeah and then of course the one really interesting thing is that um there was a calendar with some 19th century guy on the may sheet jake didn't recognize and then he did Robert Browning. Jake had quoted him in his final essay. Mm-hmm. Of course, he of Child Roland to the Dark Tower came. Um, yeah, just more connections popping up. Yep, yep. So Balazar pulls out a sheet of paper and Eddie really, really wants to see what's on it. But as they get closer, it freaks out Balazar and Andalini, which is really cool because we're like, these people are here. People can't see them. But as they like interfere, people can feel them. It's, yeah. it's really it's really strange and interesting. Yeah. And it, it makes you suspect like, well, they're probably changing the timeline in a very slight way because this mm-hmm. meeting would have gone differently if they hadn't actually t- uh, time traveled, you know, toe dashed back to this spot and and mess with these guys while they were trying to read the thing. And m- maybe a different outcome will happen now because of this. And I, I'm, I'm going to keep my eyes open for that kind of thing. Eddie still interferes. He doesn't stop. He just knows that whatever is on this paper is really, really important. And I want to talk about what is on the paper first. And then I want to go back to the weirdness that's going on as they try to look at it as the toe dash, whatever is ending. So we see that this paper is a a memorandum of an agreement. This document constitutes a pact of agreement between Mr. Calvin Tower and owning a real property, which is principally a vacant lot identified as lot number two, nine, eight. And block number 19, located in Manhattan, New York City on 46th Street and 2nd Avenue, and Sombra Corporation, a corporation doing business within the state of New York. So basically, Sombra paid Calvin Tower $100,000 to hold on to the the lot which he owns for a period of a year um, to not sell it, to not get rid of it, and to give them, um, you know, rights to the property, rights of first sale to the property. Yeah, right. So so they want it's interesting because somebody wants the rose or the lot or I'm, mm-hmm. I, I'm just going to say the rose, probably a bad guy, but like they can't for some reason they can't just like go get it or just yeah. go destroy it for, seemingly, but they're 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 holding on to the rights to the place. So maybe at some later point in time they can get it 
or destroy it. And they also seem to be trying to obfuscate the fact that they're doing that because you, you would think that they could just buy the lot from Deep Now and then do nothing to it. But instead, they've done this side deal. Uh, not Deep Now, sorry, Tower. Mm-hmm. Um, they've done this side deal where Tower Tower is the owner and they just have this side deal with him. And it's like, well, that seems com- that seems like unnecessarily complex unless they're trying to hide the fact that they're after it. Um, well, it's interesting because basically what they've done is like, I'm going to give you $100,000. You're going to promise me that for the next year, you cannot sell this. But if you do sell it, I get first right of sale. And this is coming to an end. It's May right now. It's May of 1977. In July, July 15th, 1977, this deal will come to an end. And then Calvin Tower is free to sell it to whoever he wants after that. Mm-hmm. So basically, they're coming up on the end of the deal. And gangsters are now trying to pressure Tower into selling the lot, right? Mm-hmm. That was my that's my interpretation. Yes. I, I think that's right. But like I don't get why they don't just like obviously he needs the money. I, I guess I I guess I, I might need to reread the scene. I mean they clearly mm-hmm. want it. It seemed yeah. to me like, well why didn't they just already buy it? Maybe he just is is refusing to sell. Yeah. I mean he's refusing to like you're desperate for money. You don't want to sell. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll throw $100,000 at you if you promise over the next next year to sell, but only to us. Mm-hmm. Um, so now we now we have now we have you. And if you need money, well, you have to sell to us mm-hmm. and then we win. Um, yeah, right. And and it's sort of strongly hinted that that uh, Tower is this guy who like is sort of a, his his private addiction is this bookstore mm-hmm. that like he he desperately wants to own and operate a rare bookstore in New York City. Yeah. Um and uh uh we don't really know why exactly but that like he seems to be fixated on it and willing to go into hawk with the mob um to keep the bookstore. So I that I, I I'm I don't know. Yet yet more questions as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah, I mean this is this is interesting because now we're dealing with like real estate law yeah. like how are our characters going to be able to do, do our characters need to get into this do they need to um what what do they need to do, do, do uh, we we get the idea that they that this is bad right that that these people pressuring tower that the lot is in danger and some if sombra gets it that might not be a good thing like we've now said balazar this crook this mobster is in league with sombra corporation so we can make the assumption that sombra bad guys right Mm -hmm. um so it's bad if they get the lot and it seems like he's being pressured now that they're showing up at his place of work they're taking him into the back and they're threatening him to sell um before the terms of the deal is up he's got till july 15th so um so time has become a factor somehow how how can our characters stop this what can they do Uh, time travel i don't know man All right, let's talk about the crazy shit is happening while they're trying to read the note. (laughs) Okay. So this darkness, this nothingness that Eddie describes as around them, around the stage that they're on, um, kind of starts to leak in a little bit. Eddie described as the universe, the the tower fell is closing in around them. But he also says that that blackness isn't empty. There were things in the darkness, looming shapes behind weird phosphorescent eyes, the sort of thing you saw in movies about exploring the deepest cracks of the ocean floor. Except in those movies, the explorers are always inside a steel diving bell while he and Jake, well, (laughs) Mm -hmm. uh, Todash space. It's, it's scary, Matt. It's it's scary. Uh, Yeah, man. And, and like the way this chapter ends in particular made you think like, Oh, Eddie's in deep shit. He's, he's maybe lost in Todash land. Um, but then yeah. kind of seems fine the next morning. So I, I'm, I'm really interested to see the follow up of that, you know, situation. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's weird. Cause from Olin's perspective, we see them pop into Todash space and then we see them pop back not long after. Right. Indicating that maybe this whole thing that we just experienced in this chapter was over in the course of a, a minute, maybe. Yeah. Um, Maybe, but I do like that. Like, yeah, we see this whole thing. We don't understand what's going on. This blackness, these creatures in the blackness. And then from Roland's perspective in the next chapter, King defines it. And we realize how fucking dangerous what they just did was uh-huh. that how easy it is to get lost in the place between the worlds forever and die. Yeah. That's like, oh, fuck. Right. Well, th- that's why I want to hear the follow up, because like it seems it seemed when you heard that, like, oh, and Eddie was. Eddie was messing with the process, like instead yeah, of just letting yeah. the Todash 
magic take him back to his body it, it, he he was like no no i have to read the thing and and you're like oh my god this was even more dangerous than it seemed like it was <laughs> yeah all right um let's move on to chapter three okay let's do it chapter three is titled mia and it's time to meet the fourth personality inside Susanna dean i bet you didn't see that coming i honestly didn't <laughs> <laughs> now there was a fourth woman She had been born out of the third in yet another time of stress and change. She cared nothing for Odetta, Detta, or Susanna. She cared for nothing save the new chap who was on his way. The new chap needed to be fed. The banqueting hall was near. That's what mattered and all that mattered. This new woman, woman every bit as dangerous in her own way as Detta Walker had been, was Mia. She bore the name of no man's father, only the word that in high speech means mother. Hey, remember... Remember when Susanna was pregnant, Matt? Do you do you remember that? I do, and I remember <laughs> that that there was like a demon that may have been involved, and then I remember uh, that you and Scott Wampler laughed very hard when I mentioned that I noticed this. No, that doesn't sound that doesn't sound like me. <laughs> okay, Scott Wampler <laughs> laughed very hard when I mentioned this. <laughs> no, I definitely did. I definitely did. Um, this is like. Th- three books in the making two books in the yeah, making yeah, yeah. this pregnancy yeah and here we go it's now center stage with this new personality mia um we're, we are with mia in the beginning of this chapter as she walks into a banquet hall for a feast and once again we're confused and we don't really know how this is happening where she is what's going on but once again we see that king has thrown us into the deep end and then he's going to backfill the information a little bit later in the chapter so it seems like his his mo for these first few chapters is just throw them in and then we'll explain it later yeah i mean this one this one's maybe the weirdest actually yeah yeah Mia walks into the castle and the banquet table at its center, caring about nothing but feeding her little chap. Um, But we see there's someone else here. Mia hurried that way. She saw her reflection floating below her and the electric flambeau that burned in its depths in the depths of the marble like torches underwater. But she did not see the man who came along behind her, descending the sweep curve of the stairs, not in dress pumps, but in old and range-battered boots. He wore faded jeans and a shirt of blue chambray instead of court clothes. One gun, a pistol, with a worn sandalwood grip hung at his left side, the holster tied down with rawhide. His face was tanned and lined and weathered. His hair was black, although now seeded with growing streaks of white. His eyes were his most striking feature. They were blue and cold and steady. Detta Walker had feared no man, not even this one, but she had feared those shooter's eyes. I, every time King gets to describe Roland, I love it. But but it's really interesting that he does it here. Why does he describe a role? I mean, specifically, our point of view character, Mia, doesn't see him. So this is a description meant only for us, the reader. Yeah. Um, like, it feels it feels like a weighty arrival, right? Mm-hmm. It feel, yeah. feels more, like, powerful and and like like it, more rather than simply being like the protagonist with which we are well familiar he, like he's this powerful presence he's this totemic ideal of of the gunslinger um and and also this is sort of like a spirit world so maybe this is more like a dream projection of Roland um maybe sort of more like how Roland sees himself rather than how he truly is and hmm. i mean i notice in this, this this you know rather detailed paragraph long description there's no mention of missing fingers so it makes you wonder if like, well, if this is like a dream self, then maybe he has his fingers here. Who knows? Um, but yeah, I, I, I do definitely think it's interesting how um, I, I almost said this is the this is the introduction of Roland in the book. And of course, it's not. We already saw Roland um, in Eddie's chapter. So, like, yeah, I mean, that's that's what I originally thought, too. But you're you're like, this is not the introduction of Roland in yeah. the book. Yeah, it's it, it's such a, such an interesting way of going about this right and and just the detail and the it's just beautiful it's a beautiful image i mean i'm imagining you know the 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 just the visual the visual of it the 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 electric flambeau under like you know you see the reflection of it below her through the Mm -hmm. through the through the marble um uh, it's just awesome it's it's, beautiful it's it's fantastic writing the first time i read it i honestly missed the part where 
it said she did not see the man who came along behind her. And I literally thought she was just seeing Roland out of the corner of her eyes and describing Roland from the perspective of Mia. And there are parts where like that almost seems like what it's doing, because, again, we are in Mia's point of view here. And Detta Walker had feared no man, but she feared those eyes like we're, we're firmly in the Susanna Odetta Detta Mia POV. And yet she she textually does not see the man who came along behind her. Yeah. It's almost more like Roland's POV as he is peering into her mind or something like that. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't know. It's and, and then but but not really because it's clearly stated that he can't see what she sees. Yeah. So the the, the POV is almost a, a superposition of both mm-hmm. where where we see what they are both aware of, but they're not aware of what the other is. It's very yeah. very unique actually. Yeah. I mean, it is interesting because we get this line where um like Roland is watching her eat and it says he saw no castle, but he saw her. He saw her very well. So we get this idea that Roland is not seeing the castle, not seeing the banquet table, not seeing the plates. But we don't see what Roland is seeing until we relive this entire scene again firmly in Roland's point of view, where we realize she's in a swamp naked swimming around eating frogs and shit. True. It's such an interesting it's such an interesting choice because like, yeah, whose point of view are we in here? I don't know. Yeah, indeed. Because how are we describing Roland? Like it's, it's just, it's, it's a third person, but it's loose. It's not tracking to Mia herself. It's kind of just hovering over both of them. Yeah, no, I got to take back what I said. Like it's not it, the dream self thing doesn't really make sense. Cause like he is actually following her, right? Actually, yeah, I, I might yeah. need to reread parts of this. Cause like I, I, Yes, he's actually following her and and she is only aware of him sort of well she's not aware of him. She's, she's not aware of him at all. But, no. but but he sort of shows up in the in the imagination vision. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean that we, we basically see this scene twice in this chapter. Yeah. Once from Mia's perspective of what she's seeing and then we as King is want to do we go back in time and see how roland got to this Mm -hmm. point and then we see it all from his point of view with what is actually going on yes which i think is a really fantastic way to do it because you're confused and uncomfortable by what's happening and then when you see the truth of it you're even more disgusted yeah but yeah that it's just a very interesting choice here how he frames the roland parts of this thing in particular yes definitely it's 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 both fascinating and beautiful yeah. Um, I also wanted to point out how like weirdly disturbing the use of the word chap is here. Yeah. Like, right. Like chap is normally such a like, oh, he's a he's a good old chap. It's like it's like sort of a, uh, you know, archaic usage of like fellow or something. But it's like mm-hmm. that her the little chap was coming. And it's like, oh, God, it's Satan. Yeah. <laughs> how, how, how do you take how do you take a, a name like that and turn it to ominous? It's, I, it's, it's great. Yeah, I love it. Um, so Mia is devouring the food. She's like going from, from plate to plate, just picking up stuff and shoving it in her mouth and occasionally picking up the blue four special plates that are there and, and slamming them. She's talking randomly to herself, or at least her different personalities are talking randomly. Chitter and chatter. Roland heard Odetta's cultured voice and Detta's rough but colorful profanity. He heard Susanna's voice and many others as well. How many women in her head, how many personalities formed or half formed? Oof. Oh, Oh, dear. Yeah. So we cut back from this grotesque feast earlier that night in Roland's point of view. Roland um, admits to us, the reader, that he's been noticing something wrong with Susanna for a while. The same kind of signs that indicated the shift from Odetta to Detta way back in book two. And he says, did Eddie not see those signs? Roland wondered. Eddie had been a dull observer indeed when Roland first met him, but he had changed greatly since then. And... He loved her, loved her. How could he not see? How could he, how could he, how could he and not see what Roland saw? So Eddie is just, and we saw through Eddie's perspective, we started chapter one with that. Yeah, he suspects nothing is going on. Like we, there's no, there's no even bit of subtext in anything from Eddie's point of view that he suspects something is going wrong with Susanna. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, love is blind and so forth. I, it, mm-hmm. I, I, I think, you know, this might be a, something of a theme of this book uh, even is you know eddie's eddie's uh lack of of perspective on on yeah. Susanna. yeah i mean I, I love roland's kind of musing on if i tell eddie that Susanna is pregnant and if i tell eddie 
who the father is or who I think the father is, how will Eddie react? Mm-hmm. Will he believe me? Um, uh, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. worried. I'm so worried. Yeah. <laughs> so Roland lies down waiting for everyone to go to sleep and waiting to see if Susanna wakes up again. But before that, Jake, Eddie and Oi went to dash. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, what the hell does that word mean? Uh-huh. Yep, a lot a lot of weird shit happening on this night. Yep. Uh King explains to us what the fuck just happened with Jake and Eddie in the last chapter. Going Todash is magic. Magic that was uh, taught to Roland by his old tutor Van A. Uh, like it's just a way of traveling between worlds that were told the Manny use. Dreaming, but not just dreaming. This was Todash, the passing between two worlds. Supposedly the Manny could do it, and supposedly some pieces of the wizard's rainbow could make you do it, whether you wanted to or not. One piece of it in particular. But there's no ball here. So how could it have happened? And then I love I love the doubt here. Right. It's like he says first, he says, well, I didn't go toe dash when I was using the grapefruit. And then he's a voice in his head. That's Van A is like, are you sure about that? Are you sure that that's not what? And then he's like, there's no ball here. So how could it be happening? And once again, are you sure? Are you sure there's no piece of Maryland's rainbow here? Are you sure, gunslinger? And it's just like it's just this fascinating way to introduce doubt about things you didn't even know you were supposed to be doubting. Yeah. I mean, it, when you introduce this kind of doubt, it's almost like saying there's going to be another grape. There's, there's going to be another, another orb in the story. Sure. Sure. Um, and it's going to be bad because they always are. Um, yeah. I, I think it's an interesting choice because Roland has been, you know, through most of this story, the source of information for us, the reader, like when, when there is some new weird thing in Midworld. It is Roland usually explaining to us what it is and how it works. And and that is happening again here. But King is also introducing doubt into Roland's explanation textually. Like he's he's telling us we shouldn't take all of this at face value, what he's saying, because he's like, no, there's it's not the, the grapefruit. That's different. Mm-hmm. And the text is saying, well, well yeah, well. also makes you ask, what are the implications? Like he yeah. he seems to have thought oh, I was just seeing visions in the grapefruit. And this, the implication is, well, what if you weren't just seeing visions? What if you were going toe dash? What if you were in some sense traveling, actually traveling between worlds and times and places rather than just seeing, um, yeah. what would the implications of that be? Uh, yeah, definitely. So we learned from Roland that the going toe dash is actually like super dangerous and it's really easy to fall between the worlds and into the blackness that is toe dash space where all those fucking monsters are uh-huh. yeah so you know it's it's fine yeah, the angler fish yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> damn it i i love that uh that todash has has almost triggered venet's entrance into roland's head as one of the many voices he hears like we've long talked since book two i think about the voices that pop into roland's head and and kind of uncontrollably speak to him and his tutor of na was never one of those voices um in the past but he is now and he's not just here to talk to him about todash but about what to do with mia and what to do with the visitors that are camped not too far away and and i think this is a a roland feeling overwhelmed or he's got like three different problems to deal with and he doesn't know what to do about any of them and his tutor's here saying well i got some advice for you yeah it's 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 pretty funny how this is the closest Roland really gets to being out of sorts. Like, Oh my God, every, everything's falling apart. What the hell's happening? Uh, this is just supposed to be a normal night and everybody's going on vision quests. And mm-hmm. it, yeah. it, it is interesting how, like, I feel like over the last many books, we've sort of gotten to know different voices in Roland's head. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know if it's been like one voice per book. I don't actually think it has, but like we've gotten to know court and Steven and Susan and so on kind of doled out to us slowly. We haven't really got to focus on Vene, so maybe this book is Vene's turn. Could be. Could be. It's a it's a good time for a tutor. Yep. So as Eddie and Jake go toe dash, Susanna gets up, gets into her chair, and rolls away. Roland follows her into what we realize is a swamp. We see her strip down and dive into the swamp water and begin to hunt. What while Mia saw a dress and a banquet hall with with wonderful food what is really happening in the real world is a naked Susanna is swimming through the muck and eating frogs and bugs and fish raw 
Uh huh. God, this part, man, it's fucking horrifying. This is some of the most horror that we've had in the series, as far as I'm yeah. concerned. It's like yeah. five creepy ideas rolled into one. It's like the creepiness of sleepwalking. I don't know if you've ever been around anyone who was sleepwalking, but no. you're just like, oh god, this is the worst ever. Um, like, like, like you you see why demonic possession is a is a is a concept. Um, you know, you've got the, the 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 fear of like the multiple personalities and, and the the unpredictability therein. Um, yeah. You know, I think King's doing a lot here in general with what you might call like fear of unpredictability or fear of instability when it comes to Susanna, because yeah. you know you don't you don't know you don't know like is the demon is, is the baby a demon is is Susanna gonna suddenly kind of turn into a liability or a danger to the to the quartet? It's very like it's a very uncomfortable place to be in at the beginning of the story. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I do love, you know, we talked about this way back in the day about like, OK, so we had Odetta and we had Detta and then those two personalities going to merge and you kind of, you know, wipe your hands and they're like, we did it. OK, right. we solved that problem. And now we have Susanna and she's whole and complete now. And we kind of very quickly realized that that wasn't true, that, yeah, we have Susanna, a personality created from a combination of the two. But Detta and Odetta are still there definitely still there and now we've complicated even further by adding a, a fourth personality yeah i think it's such a fascinating choice to do with the character where you think like every other fantasy story of where someone is struggling with multiple personalities like would have i feel like would have the conclusion being like just tying everything in a bow and just saying nope solved yeah and clearly not well and you know you've there there have been these moments recently in 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 the previous book where it was like odetta said or or, or detta yeah. said and at the time i was just like oh okay uh that's interesting I, I really did think that she had unified into susanna i thought that's what we were doing but okay it seems like she can slip and and now and now i'm realizing oh no that was a, a sign that she is disintegrating yeah um or, or that she was never as fully integrated as we thought and um, this is actually rather depressing because you you kind of think like, oh, you're our character is in a good place now. She's strong. She's whole. And it's like, no, nope, that's actually this is actually apparently going to be like her her conflict. Um, yeah. And I mean, we didn't really touch on this, but one of the most interesting things to me about this whole thing is that Mia is supposed to be this fourth personality whose only concern is the chap mm -hmm. doesn't care about anything else has no other personality and yet she still smashes the four special plates mm -hmm. she still smashes the blue lady's plates in triumph right so she has detta walker's hatred of the blue lady um which we believe is connected to um the the wedding she attended where she accidentally broke someone's plate and got in trouble for it right Ye um or intentionally broke got in trouble for yeah, I don't well, remember exactly. Well, that's yeah. So that's the thing. I noticed that we still have no idea what Susanna's deal is. Like we we don't know what's up with the blue lady. We don't know what's up with the four special plate. That thing that you just said that is what we know, but that's not really the explanation. It's it's it doesn't satisfy me as being like oh when she was a kid she broke a plate and no. It's like no no the, this blue lady thing matters. Mm. Uh, in fact, I think the argument I don't remember if it was the one at the end of the last book. I think it was the end of the last book. Um, it basically went out of its way to remind us, hey, you don't actually know what the blue lady is, reader. Did you notice you don't know what that is? Um, <laughs> that's all it really said. But I was like, yeah. And um, like I, it made me wonder like, OK, that happened before before she got hit by a brick. Like, I wonder if yeah. whatever is up with, you know, Odetta Holmes, you know, this person and, and everything else that happened to her. Maybe that started before Jack Mort hit her with a brick. Maybe maybe this blue lady thing was actually more foundational to whatever is going on with her. Like, we don't actually know. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, well, perhaps we will find out soon. But not this week, because this is the end of the chapter. Uh, Susanna returns back to bed and just falls asleep like nothing happened. And I love the detail that she like cleaned up after herself. She wiped down the chair, got all the mud off the chair. This is like the same thing we kind of saw with Odetta and Detta back in the day that they just were very, very good at wiping away all traces that the other one existed. And so we're seeing that mechanism 
at play here again, where she just wipes away all traces that she went on this trip and falls asleep and cuddles Eddie and like nothing ever happened. Yeah, I, I love I love the element of of this character that she is so in, like intelligent and competent because that mm-hmm. makes the whole thing so much more uncomfortable. Yes. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Because it's great when you have a competent character who's in your corner. It's less great when that competent character suddenly starts to exhibit signs of being extremely dangerous. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yep, yep, uh-huh. Yep, 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 yep. And once again, we have to say that so far Roland has kept this to himself. And we've talked about how keeping secrets in books is normally bad. Yep. But we'll see. I think one thing that this book has done over time is show that if if secrets are kept between the quartet, they are not kept for long. So um, maybe we'll see. Maybe we'll see that resolved next week. I hope so. I, I do prefer it when our our protagonists tell each other what they need to know, because yeah. I think we mentioned before, it's it's kind of a boring kind of tension when the only reason the tension exists is that the characters aren't talking to each other. Sure, 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 sure. All right. So we conclude this week's reading um, and we have a lot of shit going on. We got the strangers camped out nearby. We got Eddie and Jake's toe trip and now the fate of the vacant lot. We have the entrance of Mia into the story in her chap. And what could mean? Is this a demon? If so, what does that mean? Um, and then, of course, we have our big our big cloud over the heads, which is the wolves are coming. The wolves are coming. Uh-huh. A lot, lot of shit to deal with. A lot of shit. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> We're in it now, man. We're in it. All right. And that is it for this week's discussion question. And I'm rushing now because we are at an hour and 55 minutes. So here we go. All right. Uh, next week's discussion question is, if you could go toe dash to any point in the last four novels, where would you go and why? I think this is going to be a fun one. Yeah, I like that. All right, folks, that is it for us this week. Next week, we will be completing part one, Toad Ash. We'll be discussing chapters four through seven of part one, completing it up. So read chapters four through seven of part one, Toad Ash, and then report back next week to talk about the crazy shit that's happening. Awesome. Remember that you can reach out to us via email at kingslingerspod at gmail.com or on Twitter at kingslingerspod. And of course, you can head on over to the subreddit at uh, reddit.com slash r slash doofmedia. Yes. And keep your emails coming. I love to get them. I do not always respond to all of them, but trust me when I say I read every single one of them and I love what you guys are sending. I love your takes. I let someone sent a bunch of wonderful um, art from these books that I, I shared a little bit with Matt. It's great. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. And subscribe to us. Subscribe to Kingslingers on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else in the world you can listen to podcasts. Do them all. If yeah. you get bonus points, if you subscribe to all services. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, and if you like any of our shows and you want to support the Doof Podcast Network, consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia. If you donate $20 a month, then uh, that will allow you to produce an episode of our variety podcast, the Doofcast. And what that means is you select a movie or a short story for us to watch slash read and do a show on. Um, that's that's it. it yeah. Pr- and uh we really enjoy doing those episodes. You can make Matt watch Seven Samurai or The Magnificent Seven. You right could. there, you can do it. Um, yeah. I think we have an episode coming up within a month or so in which we're going to be watching The Mist, which is a adaptation of a Stephen King short story. So that episode is coming thanks to one of our patrons. So you could make him watch more things. This week, thank you to our new patrons, new Bidoofs, uh, Heb A, Michael Owen, and Nash. And new doof dancer, Christina H. Welcome to the community. Yes, welcome. And thank you so much for your support. We are our magic number is five now, Matt. We are five patrons away from our uh, our next big goal where our audio audio narrative project will go into production. So only five more of you. So if there are five of you listening right now that are not a patron, throw it throw a buck our way and you can make it happen. You, 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 you and you. 
Exactly. <laughs> if you cannot afford to donate, of course that's okay. We are living in crazy times and money is tight for a lot of us, so we totally understand. You can help us out by sharing this podcast uh, with all your Stephen King loving communities, as many of you have been doing. Thank you so much for doing that. You can also help us out by leaving us a rating and a review. This week's spotlight review comes from Chief Elroy, who gives us five stars and says, Great podcast. The Dark Tower series are my favorite. I have read the entire series three times, each time learning more. I can't tell you how excited I was when I discovered a podcast on the series. I also can't tell you how disappointed I was listening to most of the podcasters out there. That was until I came across Kingslingers. These guys do an amazing job telling the story the way I believe King envisioned it. Keep up the great work. I can't wait to hear more. Well, that was very nice of you, Chief. Uh, thank you so much for that. Yeah, that was that's a really heartwarming compliment. Thank it you. Is. All right, folks, that's it for us. We'll see you back here next week for some more Toe Dash. Long days and pleasant nights. And maybe you have twice the number. music. No! Oh, oh shit.